Okay, we can open it up for questions. Dr. LaFall wants to make some remarks uh, afterwards, and uh, uh, so uh, let's start. Meanwhile, I think we ought to give a round of applause to the speakers. I mean, they were great. Yes. Hi. My uh, main questions center around cancer care coordination and collaboration with primary care. So one question is the timing. When do you offer new patients Lynch syndrome testing? And then if they test positive, how do you collaborate with primary care for cascade testing with relatives and colonoscopy? Dr. Smoot, do you want to take that, the Lynch syndrome testing? Well, <clears throat> um, with, with the screening and the uh, testing, um, with this? Is it on? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, okay. so I, I think it's very important for communication, as you mentioned, if you have people uh, that have a family history of, of colon cancer, uh, that they come in and they get screening. Um, we recommend that uh, patients are um, uh, followed very frequently uh, when they when they are when they are um, positive for polyps. Uh, but I wasn't clear as far as totally your question. Are you talking about blood testing or genetic no, testing or microsatellite instability? I'm under, I was at a conference at CDC um, over the summer and different folks from different places. Um, handle the testing differently. Yeah. Sometimes it's just an opt-out. And, you know, so I'm just kind of curious to how you are handling um, testing of newly diagnosed patients in light of the uh, evidence-based practice guidelines. So I'd like to add, and then I'll ask Dr. Benton to add more. Um, the management of patients with colon and rectal cancer must be multidisciplinary. So when a patient is found to have microsatellite instability, uh, first is tested in the tumor and then in the germline. And in the patients who are found to have germline mutations, we already have the um, uh, we already have the um, counselors, the genetic counselors involved. We have the primary care physician, the oncologist, the surgeon, uh, radiation therapy if needed, uh, and the pathologist. And we meet together as a team so that we can discuss this, we can discuss what are the implications for the family and how the family uh, should be notified uh, and involved. Uh, so it's a continuous ongoing process. It's long term. And there are now some NCCN uh, guidelines on how, and Dr. Benson might uh, discuss that since he was the chair of the NCCN. Uh, Henry Lynch, um, who gives wonderful talks about his syndrome, makes uh, a critical point that by and large, uh, clinicians do a terrible job taking the family history. And the essential message for primary care providers and certainly oncologists who are seeing uh, individuals at risk for inherited uh, syndromes is to start with the family history and uh, try to determine what the risk uh, is of such. And I agree with Edith. We um, make every effort to refer to genetic counseling when we identify high-risk individuals. And the report that is generated to make sure that that report is uh, sent to uh, the entire medical team, so the primary care provider, um, who is often more directly involved with the family members and help uh, to uh, promote screening. And uh, as Edith mentioned, the NCCN does have guidelines to uh, assist people, and right in your office, these guidelines can be pulled up to uh, give some direction. 
but I think we all have to remember it starts with the family history and uh, trying to uh, tease out those who are at risk, not only for Lynch syndrome, for example, but a number of other cancers. Okay. We Thanks. Also, we also try to uh, get the information back from pathology as quickly as possible. So the pathologist is very key to this uh, because the surgical management of the patient uh, with Lynch's syndrome may be different. And in some cases, uh, if you do these studies on the biopsy after colonoscopy, the surgical intervention is different. So that it's really disappointing to get a result back after the patient has already gone and underwent a limited resection when what they should have had was uh, a total colectomy. Okay, maybe we can take a question from up front. Uh, yeah, it's George Simpson, Miami, Florida. And uh, I'll start out by my disclaimer. You can blame this on my age. <laughs> I thought last year I was the oldest guy here until this 100-year-old guy walked in and I sat down. <laughs> but uh, this was stimulated by uh, an experience I had the only patient I know that I had in common with Dr. LaFall was an oral surgeon from Miami who had a rectal tumor. I don't remember this. And the diagnostic method was a digital examination. And uh, we've heard a lot about early diagnosis, but I have not heard today the importance of the essential inspection, palpation, auscultation, and percussion, and the digital examination. That was my comment. We need to continue because I think I have diagnosed more that way than by colonoscopy. The second thing is uh, uh, some years ago there was, when this first came up, the difference between the incidence of cancer in African blacks and American blacks. And there was a higher incidence in American blacks, just like there was a difference in the Japanese, uh, in American Japanese and uh, native Japanese and stomach cancer, for instance. And they finally found out they, at that time, this is some years ago, I don't know if it's changed, although Dr. Hamilton has said something to this uh, effect. Has there been any few of, uh, later knowledge about the causes? Because originally it was thought to be blamed on low fiber diet in the United States and indoor plumbing, that is defecation position versus what it was in Africa, and whether there's any change in the uh, genetic, the GNA, uh, um, DNA rather, composition or others, whether it is still diet and environment. Dr. Smith? I, I think there's still, uh, yes, the diet and environment is a big part. Uh, we see a lot of Africans also at Howard, and I'm surprised by how many we are finding now with um, adenomas. And I think in Africa now, there are more people now that can afford and eat meat. And I think that's changing things. And I think the lifestyle also is becoming a little more sedentary um, as people are getting around more easily. So I think that those things are differences, but I think we're beginning to see that some of the um, advancement of the uh, U.S. into other countries and our lifestyle is uh, impacting this disease. Okay, another question. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Tibet, Washington, D.C. For my question, some is related to this. I was in initially interested in the slide you showed in Egypt, where the incidence uh, dropped after about 50 years of, of age or so. And so I was wondering <coughs> whether this took into account the lower life expectancy in that population. That's one. And the other reason I'm asking this question also, I do get, and, and I'm glad Dr. Smooth mentioned something about the Africans they see, I do get some resistance from Africans here who, have, who now live here. They, th they feel that colon cancer, they don't get it. It's like, you know, their fathers or some never had it, they won't get it. But they've been living here for 20, 30 years. So we are now having to put more pressure on them to co you know, convince them to go ahead and get screening. So that leads to why I'm interested in that slide and uh, whether there's any uh, consideration taken into, uh, in evaluating this slide regarding to the low life expectancy in that. And then second to uh, that is, is there any 
study looking at the subpopulation of Africans who now live here over the last 20, 30, 50 years and the incidence of cancer in them, <coughs> the colon cancer in them. Stan, do you want to address? Uh... The, um, no, to the, to the second point you mentioned, I haven't seen any recent studies looking at the Africans in the, in the U.S. having a higher incidence. I see it right now they're getting lumped as all African Americans, but I haven't seen that being teased out. But as I said, I think as you, as you commented on, and I think as you've seen in your patients that we are seeing polyps as we do screen in this population that have been here 10 or more years and maybe even some that are still going back and forth. Um, I, as far as uh, the, pol the, the overseas, I think that the, there might be some impact because of the, um, higher, um, the age as far as the, l the life expectancy being lower. That true, that, that might be contributing. That is possible. Okay, let's up front now. Go ahead. Actually, I prefer if she went first. I got a few questions. Okay. <laughs> I may have a few questions. <laughs> I, I just want to thank the panelists uh, for an excellent uh, presentation. I wanted to ask, uh, with respect to addressing, you know, the racial divide in colon and rectal cancer, uh, you know, we, you, why do we keep promoting sigmoidoscopy? I mean, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, with your point, with respect to performing a full physical exam and certainly obtaining a full... Uh, history from the patient and family history, and sometimes in our patient population with respect to family history, it's very limited. Uh, but, but why do we still promote sigmoidoscopy? And could you also address the issue of um, uh, preparation, uh, proper preparation for colonoscopy and the effect that has in terms of identifying polyps and cancers? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if you're going to promote people to screen, you know, why not do the whole thing as opposed to part of that? Uh, and I just wanted to ask Dr. Mitchell with respect to uh, improvement in survival. Uh, certainly all our patients and ourselves uh, would want a, a longer survival, um, but are there correlations with respect to quality of life issues uh, with respect to patients when we're pushing the envelope with, with new uh, therapies and although we're doing much, much better with respect to dealing with side effects? Thank you. Just to, to take the first part of your question, I, uh, you're right, uh, we should be promoting full colon cancer screening. Uh, the reason we still mention the screening uh, flexible sigmoidoscopies is because the studies did show that that did reduce uh, colorectal cancer incidence and therefore does have quote unquote benefit. But uh, the, the professional societies do try to state that that is a secondary choice and that colonoscopy should be the first choice. And so we're trying to list that second and um, promote uh, full evaluation of the colon as the uh, best way uh, to do the screening. And as you mentioned, to do effective screening, we do need to do good preparations. Uh, there are new preps that are coming out now that are lower volume uh, that work effectively, and I think as we can move to some of the lower volume preparations, we'll get better compliance. Uh, but a compliance with the uh, preparation is very important. I think it, that we need to stress that uh, with our patients uh, that if they can uh, do their best to uh, follow all of the instructions uh, because you do want to have just the one test and you don't want to have to come back, uh, and that's important. Thank you. Edith, you want to address the quality of life in addition to Certainly. the improved survival? Um, quality of life is very important for patients. Not only do we want to improve the length of life, but the quality of life. Uh, so therefore, Management of toxicities um, and drug-drug interactions is very important. That's a major part of therapy. Uh, I looked at a clinical trial some years ago with acetaminophen, Tylenol. And if you look at the complications of Tylenol, for example, uh, in children, but also in adults, um, I mean, it's tremendous. And I say that to say all drugs have some side effects. They have some impact on uh, organ function and sometimes multiple organs. Now, what I was not able to show uh, this afternoon because of time, uh, that there was a quality of life assessment that went along with the study I showed on management of side effects. And the patients who received the intervention 
actually uh, reported that they had a better quality of life. Uh, so that was in addition to what the providers observed. Uh, so management of side effects, trying to decrease the side effects of therapy, decrease drug-drug interactions, and decrease the impact of uh, these drugs on organ function is really an important part of what we do and quality of life is very important for patients. It's also very important for clinicians to understand these side effects so that you can modify them, uh, their treatment planning as needed. Ali, you have another comment? Yeah, just to uh, add what Edith mentioned, uh, there actually have been randomized clinical trials, for example, uh, with the rena TCAN versus best supportive care. And, what, and these are type of studies we can't really do in the United States, but they have been done in Europe, which showed that not only was survival improved with the arena TCAN, but the quality of life measures, even taking into account the toxicity of arena TCAN, were superior for those who had chemotherapy. And there, in GI cancers, there have been other studies, for example, in gastric cancer, that demonstrate the, the same principle. And I think both Edith and I have been doing this a long time, and uh, I think we've, it, it's absolutely evident in our practices we have so many more patients who are not only living substantially longer, but are remaining very productive. They're working full time, they're caring for their families, and when we started out, with metastatic disease, this was something you just did not see. Right. So it, it's just obvious to uh, all oncologists, I think, who see these individuals. Okay, you want to start? Yeah, I got five quick questions. The first Whoa. two. <laughs> we got two more people behind you. They're going to be real quick. First of all, my name is Fred Burton from Philadelphia. Edith, two questions for you quickly. Uh, the first, uh, that anti angiogenic agent you mentioned. Uh, is that your favorite anti-angiogenic, and what's the side effect profile? Those are two questions. Well, bevacizumab is the only anti-angiogenic agent approved for colon and rectal cancer. Um, it um, has a side effect profile. Yeah, I'll try uh, the so. most important, the most frequent side effect is hypertension, and it could be an increase in the blood pressure of a patient with pre-existing hypertension or development of hypertension in a patient who was normotensive prior to. So watching the blood pressure is very important. Thrombotic phenomenon and the increase in uh, DVT is very apparent, so we have to watch that. But we also know that patients over age 65 who have a history of arterial thromboses, meaning heart attack or stroke, uh, have a higher incidence of side effects from this drug. So we are really very cautious in looking at, one, what are the side effects, and two, the population and what the patient's pre-existing medical conditions uh, might add to their risk from this drug. The other side effect is poor wound healing. Gotcha. Dr. Smoot, uh, cigarette smoking and colorectal cancer. Got any... Uh hunch at the mechanism? Uh, no, no. We're not really sure of, of what the mechanisms, whether it's the nicotine, uh, but the idea that, that is that, that the, increases the risk for the development of polypolyps to progress to cancer, so that people develop cancer at a younger age. Okay, okay. now on the, on the point of facts, uh, Eskimos and the Indians who live in Alaska, particularly uh, Matthew Henson has a son, he left up there with a uh, bird when they did that uh, North, uh, North Pole thing. And uh, his son was found when he was 80 years old. He hadn't eaten anything but animal, pretty much, and never eaten anything cooked. And he was in perfect health at 80 years old. Now, how do we reconcile this high fat thing that we're talking about with the colorectal cancer and these folks that eat primarily only fat? But I, I think you have to look at the difference between the animal fat and the fish. So the cold water fish have a lot of omega-3s. But they don't just eat fish. They see yeah. They whale eat a lot of other kind of animals oh. of fat. <laughs> okay. I think right. we're going to, unfortunately, we, we uh, have a hard stop here at, at uh, uh, 
that we have to move on, I think. Uh, then Dr. LaFall. Can you answer the question, though, first? Pardon me? Well, you I, can't, you can't make, do you have an answer? I'm just saying, I don't know. You can't make a, a conclusion from one patient. I can tell you about my mother's uncle, Jack, who smoked as long as I could remember, and he lived to be 90-some years old, and he smoked, but he never got lung cancer. Okay, I think the, the subsequent questions need to be asked individually. I'm sorry, but Dr. LaFalle wanted to make a, a comment before Dr. Faggett yes. uh, has his closing remark. Very well. Yes, I would just uh, like to say, as chair of the President's Cancer Panel, we listen to many groups, and I would like to state to the panel that I think you're outstanding. And that's, I just want to let everybody know, I think you're outstanding as a panel. Okay. <laughs> Upon a personal privilege, it just so happens that Dr. Smoot's father and I were members of the same class at Howard University, the class of 1952. He would be proud of you, Dr. Smoot, today. The last comment I want to make is one about Dr. Cobb, something we did not mention. He was very active in being sure that black physicians got positions on predominantly white hospital staffs. At an NMA meeting, he and I were together, and a young man came up and said to him, Dr. Cobb, why are you creating all uh, this fuss? Uh, you don't have any patients. You don't practice. Dr. Cobb, maintaining what I call that high standard of surgical discipline, equanimity under duress, said, <laughs> you're right, young man. I don't have any patients, but you do. That's why I'm doing it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Fall. Thank, I want to thank you all for attending this symposium today. Uh, again, one other point of personal privilege, I think uh, we'd like to recognize Dr. Montague Cobb's daughter. Uh, Amelia Gray, would you please stand and be recognized? Amelia Gray. <laughs> and again, uh, the Cobb Institute strives to achieve health equity for populations of color and others through research policy analysis. The vision of Cobb is to become a premier resource center for data information research. And again, uh, I think this panel demonstrates the quality of symposia that will be coming in the future as well. We want to really thank the staff, again, Dr. under Dr. Morgan's uh, and Dr. Lorenzen's direction, uh, Faith Mullenberg, Yolanda Boma, Dr. Richard Quick, Doris Glover. Uh, I think let's give them a hand, all the job they did. <laughs> And a special thanks to folks we couldn't do without, uh, our supporters, Eli Lilly, Amgen, uh, Genetech uh, Healthcare. Again, these proceedings uh, can be viewed on OnQ View TV. Uh, we'll be able to give you the details on that. Uh, we will have a reception uh, at 6 o'clock in this very room. Unfortunately, we do have to clear this room <laughs> uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I would ask, I know Bobby Williams has some questions, so. Uh, I'm sure the panel would, can meet you out uh, in the, in the uh, vestibule, okay? Again, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to eliminating racial and ethnic health crises in, in, in America and getting health equity. Thank you all. Thank you.